Hi, my name is Ted Pavlik, and I'm a faculty member here in the School of Sustainability and the School of Complex Adaptive Systems. And in our schools, we teach students how to make sense of the complexity of real world systems, interconnections of many different uh, components that are valuable for thinking about the wicked problems related to global futures. And when we build these systems, then we often have to make sense of things like randomness and chaos. Now, these are two terms that I'm guessing that you've heard in everyday language, just from people sort of talking casually with each other. And a lot of times people think that these are synonyms. And what I wanna to talk to you about today is how these two terms are actually far different from each other. And it is important for us when we think about systems to recognize those differences. Sure, in your everyday chat, you know, you probably can still swap them back and forth, but we need to start building models and understanding the, the world from a more quantitative perspective, then we definitely need to put these two terms in different camps. So let's take a look at these things so we can find out like what is randomness and what is chaos. Now, most of the times when people talk about randomness, they say, you know, I think the world is fundamentally random. And what they sort of mean by that is, uh, you know, at some point, you can't really predict what's going to go on just based on, you know, how the world seems to be at this moment. And if you get down to like the quantum mechanical levels, then, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe the fabric of reality is fundamentally random. But most of the things that we encounter every day, they really aren't random, but they're just so difficult for us to keep track of all of the tiny little moving parts that they may as well be. And so randomness really reflects a lack of information uh, that about maybe, you know, small scale processes that are, that are going on. And because of that, the world appears to behave as if there is no predictability or, um, uh, you know, there is no determinism. So oftentimes when we build models, we have a choice. Either we need to try to fill in those missing details that we can't quite make sense of. We need to keep track of every single molecule in the room or we just do what our brains do. And we say, you know what, maybe it's good enough for us to forget about all of that underlying you know, details and bookkeeping and then make our model simpler and just assume that once we get to a particular level, then everything at that point is just random. So it's meant to simplify our model building. Now there's this other phenomenon called chaos. Now chaos is an apparent randomness that emerges from sometimes very simple systems that actually are not random. So in this case, you might put together a system out of a couple of components, not that many of them, but if they're just the right components put together in just the right way, you might think that everything is going to behave in sort of a very smooth way. But every time you turn that system on, it seems to behave differently. And it makes you feel like the system is somehow fundamentally random. When it turns out that if you look at that system from the right perspective, you can actually determine that all of those apparently different outcomes you get every time you turn that, you know, that system on, you turn that dishwasher on or that uh, laundry machine on or whatever, all of those different variations in those outcomes actually are predictable. They're ordered. So chaos, you know, I, I, I hate this phrase when people tell you, say, oh, but you know, um, there's, um, you know, making order from chaos or, we, you know, making, you know, the, making it sound like chaos and order are on opposite sides of a battlefield or something like that. In reality, chaos is ordered. So an ordered system, a predictable system can behave chaotically. But if you look at it the wrong way, then you're going to think it's behaving in an unpredictable, random way. Um, and in reality, you just maybe aren't looking at the system in the right way. Now, we generally want to avoid systems that have chaos because they're just hard to deal with. And so occasionally we can't avoid them and we have to deal with them. But we love introducing randomness into our models because randomness makes the world easier. And let me kind of uh, demonstrate that using an approach called stochastic modeling. So this idea that you can take the tiny little details of the world that are so hard to keep track of and replace them by just assuming that they're random <clears throat> is something that we refer to as stochastic modeling. See, the word stochastic, it comes from the Greek for guessing or conjecturing. And so the idea here is that 
you replace a fine-grained understanding of every single little thing that's going on, what every single molecule of air around me is doing and how they're bouncing into each other and hitting me and all that sort of stuff. And you say, I am not going to deal with all of that. I am just going to assume that things are random. I'm going to just make the conjecture that this system behaves as if all these things are fundamentally random. I'm not saying the world is fundamentally random. I don't care if the world is fundamentally random. I'm just saying I can do a pretty good job predicting what's going on in the world if I assume the world is fundamentally random. So basically, by assuming randomness, it just makes it so that we don't have to include so many things in our models of the world, and but our models of the world will still be useful in predicting what's going on in the real world, as long as we choose the randomness just right. So let me make that a little bit more concrete. Let's say that I'm modeling population growth. And so a simple population that I want to maybe model are these bacteria, these asexually reproducing bacteria that divide once every W time units. And so you know W time units could be every five seconds. And so on average, um, every little bacteria, if you sit there and you watch it, then sometimes it'll divide after three seconds, sometimes it'll divide after seven seconds, but every little bacterium um, on average is gonna divide after five seconds. And so if I were to draw out a timeline, then I could say, all right, I'm gonna watch a little bacterium and uh, you know, oh, it divided, and then I'm gonna start my stopwatch and then wait for it to divide again. And that might be less than the average. And then I maybe wait for it to divide the next time. That's less than the average. But then a little bit later, it's more than the average. And then a little bit later, less, and so on and so forth. So basically, if I was to watch this little bacterium, how often it's dividing, then uh, I get a lot of variability. But it does still seem to stick around some average dividing time. Now, I, if I want to generate an accurate model in a computer of how often this, this bacteria is going to divide, I might need to know a lot of physiological details of what's going on inside that little cell. And so I might need to keep track of where all these little organelles are or, uh, you know, or, you know, the, how hot things are. I, I might need to know a whole lot of details in order to keep track of when a particular bacteria is gonna divide. And then once it divides, I'm gonna to have to keep track of that for two of them. And then more and more and more of that. It's just, it would be impossible for me to model all of those details. So the thought is, well, you know, if I look at this, it's kind of like a board game, right? So if you're playing a board game like Monopoly or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, these board games end up giving you variable outcomes of just through die rolls. So they kind of like wash over all the details. They say, I don't know if you're going to win this battle. Rather than us modeling all the tiny little details of what could go on in the model, we're just going to roll for it. And you roll for it and you see if you won the battle and you move on from that. And sometimes you win the battle, sometimes you don't. As long as the card that sets up how you win the battle maps, you know, in a kind of a realistic way. So most of the time you lose the battle, but sometimes you win, then we're happy. Similarly with this bacteria, you can imagine I map out you know, certain division times to certain sides of a die roll. So if it comes up a particular uh, side of the die roll, then it gets a short division time. It comes up a different side of the die roll, it gets a long division time and so on and so forth. By rolling that die roll, if I can kind of choose the mapping from the faces of the die to the division times, I can probably end up generating a trajectory for these division times of the bacteria that looks pretty darn realistic. And that's the idea behind stochastic modeling, is that stochastic, the word stochastic, it itself is not a synonym for random. It is a method of introducing randomness into a model. It is a method of understanding how to use randomness to make a realistic looking model without actually having to demonstrate all of the things that are in reality. And so um, that is you know, the basics of stochastic modeling. And like I was saying, you can end up doing this. So how do we end up doing this inside the computer? Well, it's the same way you do it in that Dungeons and Dragons game. You imagine, what if I have a 20-sided die? Well, I know each side of the, the die comes up an equal number of times. You know, you're, you're just as likely to get a one as you are to get a 20. 
So you basically can say, make a, a set of rules here to say, well, you know, if I get rules one through 10, if I get sides one through 10, then I'm going to get a particular outcome that will happen 50% of the time. But if I get these different pairings, 11 and 12, 13, uh, 14, and so on and so forth, I'm going to get one of uh, these other outcomes that occur far less often than that first outcome right there. So I just need to come up with a mapping from the 20 sides of this die to however many outcomes that I want to simulate on my board game. And I can make this extremely simple. Like I might only have two outcomes, whether you win or lose a battle, for example, or in this little time slice that I'm simulating in the bacterial growth, is this bacteria gonna divide right now? Or is it gonna wait until the next time slice for us to play another round of this? So you could imagine saying that, well, if I roll a 20-sided die and I get one through 15, then it doesn't divide. But in the rarer case where I get 16 through 20, then it divides. And so I have basically turned a fair 20-sided die into an unfair coin, which has been designed to mimic how often bacteria divide when I'm looking at them with these tiny little time slices moving ahead in future. And that is effectively how we implement these stochastic models inside a computer. There's one tiny little hiccup though, is that computers aren't fundamentally random. So they don't actually have just a single die that they can count on that every time they roll, it'll come up with a random outcome. And so in a computer, what they've basically implemented is the mathematical version of a bunch of 20-sided die that every time you roll them, they give you the same long sequence of numbers. And so if you want things to make sure that you're actually generating a new outcome from like a new play of the board game, you have to play the board game again with a different 20-sided die. And there's a bunch of these different 20-sided dies loaded up into a computer. If you run your simulation or play your board game with one of them, you might win that game. But if you um, play it with another one, you might lose that one. So from the bacteria case, if I were able to start the bacterial simulation with one of these die, then I might get a huge population of bacteria after a short time. But if I run it with a, another die, then uh, I might get um, not quite so big of a population growth after, um, a, after the same amount of time. So the idea here is I want to run the same stochastic simulation a bunch of times, each one with different die, and then be able to analyze what happens. And it's kind of like analyzing, you know, people playing gambling in Vegas, is that eventually you figure out what the odds are. And so it's a way for us to study realistic variation without actually having to go out and set up a bunch of different Petri dishes. So just to give you an example of what that kind of looks like, we can build these simulation models and you can learn how to do that in some of the courses that we teach in our school. And they look a lot like this. They don't, um, you know, inside these little diagrams here, there's a little bit of math, but overall um, we present these models, not like big mathematical equations, but instead like these little diagrams like that. And this particular one um, happens to depict the average case. So I'm not doing adding any randomness. I'm just pretending that what if, um, in this case, I simulated death. They start out with a particular population of bacteria and every bacteria um, you know, dies after a, um, after a particular average lifetime. And so they're, um, they, then the question is, how long does it kind of take for this population to um, gradually die out? And so you end up getting on average, this is kind of what the population will look like. You might start out with a thousand bacteria and then over time it gets uh, sort of follows this nice smooth decay curve here. Now there's no randomness. So in a real population, you would expect that some of these populations would hang out for longer before they head down, some of them would head down sooner and so on. So when we wanna add in that randomness, we have ways that we can do that by adding in these dies and these random number streams that I was talking about there. And basically behind the scenes, all they do is they slice up time and they basically say at this particular time step, if I look at all of the bacteria that are in my population right now, um, which one of these are gonna survive to the next time step? And I can flip that weighted coin and basically it's kind of like in Gladiator, you know, it's like the emperor deciding whether this person, you know, ends up staying or going. And so we can end up saying that, well, for some bacteria, they're going to stick around, the other ones, they're going to die out. And that 
is going to allow us to choose some to subtract and then play the game again for another time step. And we can do this over and over and over again, and we'll always have a whole number of bacteria, just like a, you know, a realistic system. And so what you end up getting is something that if I, you know, you probably can't really see here, but I'm gonna zoom in here in a second, is that a, a, a round of this bacterial game that we've played ends up the little red line here. Um, the blue line is that average trajectory that we'd expect across all games, all board games, all simulations. And the red line is a particular one. And you can see that sometimes it's, uh, it's a little farther from the average and sometimes it's pretty darn close to the average. If I zoom in, it's a little bit easier to see that I have a very different characteristic here. This is a much more realistic trajectory of bacteria than this kind of average view. And so if I select different, you know, die, different 20 sided die and effectively play the game over and over and over again, then I get a bunch of different outcomes, a bunch of different trajectories. And if I zoom in on them, I get to see that there's realistic variation, but then on average, they behave like the average here. So this allows me to not only capture the average trends, but it also allows me to capture how much variation I'm gonna get in the outcome. So when you play Monopoly, it kind of tells you not only how often you win or lose, but um, it maybe also tells you that sometimes you win big and sometimes you, you lose really bad and so on and so forth. And so that's what we can do in these simulations here. So stochastic modeling is this idea where we're going to introduce randomness, even where it probably doesn't exist in the real systems. But if we introduce the right randomness, we can get realistic outputs in our computer simulations that are sandboxes that we can play in. And we can experiment with these computer simulations as if they're the real world system. And we're going to get outcomes that look like our real world systems. So that's kind of um, the upside of that. The downside of that is if we want to understand the real, the average trends of it, well, it's just like in the real world. If you run an experiment in the real world, a Petri dish in the real world, you might need lots and lots of Petri dishes to make sure that whatever you learn from the one Petri dish generalizes across all the Petri dishes. And that's the downside with this too. We might need to run, we might need to play our board game multiple times to really see that I am a dominant player over someone else, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how stochastic and randomness works. So randomness is just a modeling tool to make our lives easy. So let me close up here with then contrasting that with chaos. So chaos, again, is this other sort of exciting term, and it's an extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. So just to give a little bit of background here, sometimes we, we you know, in sustainability, we care about things like the sustainability of populations of fish, say in fisheries or in our oceans. And we can build simple models of the population dynamics of fish, for example. And in these simple population models, if there's no harvesting, then no matter how many fish you start with, then they follow the kind of a similar shaped curve and they all end up in the same place. So they all reach what we refer to as carrying capacity. And so eventually the fish grow until they end up becoming limited by the amount of food and they end up kind of re, um, you know, finding this balance. It's not very a uh, very healthy balance, but it's kind of this balance between births and deaths that is ultimately set up by a limited amount of food. So we start with different initial conditions, but we end up in the same place. That's how most you know, well-behaved systems uh, are, are like. But the issue is sometimes we build systems that look as simple as that system. But when we go down into the math of it, and I'm sorry, I put a little equation here, but yeah, I won't go into the details here. But the point is that there are certain relationships between aspects of things in our systems that are just evil enough that when the systems are so simple, they still, they don't behave like that fish population system where a different initial condition still produces the same ultimate result. So if I simulate this thing the way I did with a fish population, then if I try a bunch of different initial conditions, then what I end up finding out is that for all of those different initial conditions, there are three of them here, the, the trajectory of the system, the long-term behavior of the system never quite locks up. They never quite look just right. So I start out with different initial conditions. And if I magnify that, the patterns don't even look at all the same. It really looks like there's randomness in this, uh, this system. It really looks like 
there's um, something else external that's kind of shaken up the system that's making one initial condition look so very different than the other initial condition. But in the end, it's really just the way the system was built. There's something special in the mathematics of these systems, and these are things that we can study, is that that makes it so that in that initial conditions kind of maintain their individuality so that every initial condition kind of has with it a different outcome throughout all of time so that regardless of where you are in time the initial impact of whatever the starting condition of that system is still it kind of holds on so the whereas in the fish system the initial fish population was wiped away over time so eventually you had no idea how many fish started in that system here that never really happens and that is a chaotic system the trajectories appear random but really they're a deterministic uh, consequence of exactly what input we started with which what initial condition we started so this particular system that I showed you is one that has a property that we learn about in our, our coursework here, where we talk about nonlinear feedback with delay. And if you have a system that has these two properties, feedback loops that have nonlinear feedback, so these sort of fancy equations here that have fractions in them and things that have a little bit of delay in them. So something that happens in one part of the system that's connected to another part of the system doesn't actually end up sending its influence through that connection until a little bit of a delay. If you have both of those things, you can get these ugly chaotic dynamics. But the crazy thing is that's not the only thing that can cause chaos. You can have other systems like this one here that I've got here where, again, I won't go into the math here, but the idea here is there's three variables that we pay attention to in the system. And you can think of this as like, uh, it's the number of fish in the system, how many uh, fish are reproducing in the system and, um, and uh, maybe um, how, how crowded the system is at the time or something like that. So there's three variables that we can keep track of. They're measurable variables in the system. And if they depend on each other in just the right ways, even without delay, you can get chaos. And so if I were to simulate these systems, these are trajectories of those three different variables across three different initial conditions for all three different those variables. And we can see, you know, there's none of these colors ever end up overlapping on itself. It just looks like there's a, a total randomness here. Maybe things start out with a pattern that we kind of recognize, but that pattern is, you know, it, it ends up going away so that out here, um, it's all gone. So even with three of these variables, we can still get this chaos. But what's cool about this multivariable case is if we're smart enough to think about this, we can learn to plot, to look at these systems in different ways, where instead of looking at one variable throughout time, what we can end up doing is saying, well, what if I take two of those variables in my system and I just pair them up together and plot them together so that every point in my plot is a different time point that matches up two of those variables. So now I've got one variable on one axis, like fish population, the other one on fish growth rate, and I plot them against each other so that every point on these lines is a different time. And what we can see is that with different initial conditions, they carve out the same shape in this space. So it looks like this funny shape here. And so um, if I go here, there's an animation of this shape. And so this little dot, is representing a different output of the system at different times. And they all sit on this funny little like you know, plate that's been bent into this shape here. And this is what they call a strange attractor. And it is a hallmark of systems that appear fundamentally random, but when you look at them, you find out that they actually seem to be behaving according to rules. And we can look at these strange attractors and try to figure out what those rules are. And once we figure out what those rules are, then it helps us understand why systems behave like they do. So if we go in out into a real world system and we end up finding something that looks apparently noisy, if we don't go into a little bit more analysis, we can't actually assume that it's noise or randomness. It might actually be hidden order. And we have to learn tools to find that hidden order. And um, if we do find that hidden order, then it reveals to us that it wasn't random, it was chaotic. 
or chaos. And so chaos represents uh, when, when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. It has order, but it doesn't always have predictability. And if you've heard about the butterfly effect, it's all about this idea. The butterfly effect is not about a butterfly flapping its wings and causing all of these global events. The butterfly effect is about a world where the butterfly's wings are one way compared to a world where the butterfly's wings are the other way. And if you compare those two worlds, they might look like fundamentally different worlds. It's not that the butterfly caused processes, it's that the initial conditions are so important to the dynamics of that world that they look like totally different worlds, when in the, underneath it all, they actually operate under exactly the same rules. So that's what we talk about when we talk about chaos. And that's all I kind of want to talk to you about today, chaos and randomness, and uh, how these two things are often confused, but are the farthest um, from from things. They're, they're so far apart, they're meant to be exact opposites. So I hope you start using those terms differently when you do start chatting about these systems. And if you're interested in more, I hope you take a look at our offerings in the School of Complex Adaptive Systems and the School of Sustainability, where we are all thinking about these sorts of effects all the time. And hope you think about that.